in the Seeker world, not all supernatural evils have a supernatural origin. Sometimes the darkest psychic stains can have a very human source. Hello, welcome to Q&A, the newly merged version of Questions and Answers. Today, I want to look at the Black House, and I'm going to warn you, I feel I could not address this topic properly without delving into some real-world issues. So if you don't want to hear about politics, or if you find discussion of things such as rape, murder, prison, abuse, gun violence, and Nazis upsetting, uh, I suggest you don't watch the rest of this video. If that's okay, then on to the Black House. We received the mission from John Wolfe. Even he acknowledges that there's something uniquely evil about the place. That becomes apparent as soon as you approach. There's very little growing here. The only spot of green is around this animal well. If you try to approach from the front, you are knocked back by a spectral force. There are two things I want to note here. First, notice this blood stain on the doorstep. Second, if you enter here in anima form, you can clearly see a female ghost, presumably Carrie Killian, wandering around the porch. When we approach from the back, we are allowed entry, but we are immediately hit by a shower of embers. This deals actual damage to us, and to anyone unprotected, to the average person, this would probably be severely disfiguring, if not fatal. And blink if you miss it, but looking out the window, you can see her ghost drift in from the backyard. But wait a minute, wasn't her ghost on the porch? Inside, we find several newspaper clippings discussing the case. We find one in this room, which triggers the walls to start bleeding, and one in the bathroom, which triggers the room to start filling with smoke and burning. However, note the bathtub. There's a blood stain in it, too. And it might be hard to differentiate it from the blood from coming from the walls by this point, but it is genuinely different, and it remains while the other blood seems to evaporate. Down in the basement, we find Carrie Killian's will, as well as a sleeping bag, a lantern, and some vandalism. We also find this mysterious candle, which I will discuss when I get to lore placement. In the back of the house, we find her grave along with these other tombstones. Now, their purpose becomes clear when we try to recover her ashes. They are part of a ward that binds her spirit to this spot. This seems like a necessary cruelty, even for the Illuminati. We eventually set her spirit free. Good job, right? So how do we explain some of the more unusual features here, such as the bloodstains, and the fact that these newspaper articles are in here at all? I believe the bloodstain on her porch was meant as a warding. Blood is a powerful ritual implement, even for a white witch. It's likely that she placed the blood here to bind a spirit, the spirit that guards her porch. Maybe one she found on one of her exorcisms back when the town trusted her a little more. The blood in the tub might be more symbolic than anything. I believe this is where Carrie Killian died. I'll admit, the first time I played this, when the doors locked behind me, I thought that I was supposed to hide in the tub. Maybe it would reduce the fire damage, but I was very wrong. As for the newspaper articles, we find one in an area where her ghost attacks with embers, and one in the tub where she attacks with smoke and heat. These articles were likely dropped by a previous explorer, maybe sometime very soon after Carrie Killian's death. Those explorers may not have gotten out alive. In that case, it would make sense for the Illuminati, neither knowing or caring about her will, to bind her spirit. The reason she's so active now is because of the general weakening of wards around the island. The ones holding her specter at bay were no exception. As for the vandalism, 
the sleeping bag and the open basement window. Most likely, those are from the kids mentioned in the lore who would come here on a dare to try to stay the night and then would flee through the front door. The door doesn't bar people from exiting. Now, for the lore locations, this is one of the few cases where most of the locations make perfect sense and you can even discern facts about the situation from where they are located. You receive lore number one when you activate the candle, but be careful. If no one on the map has already activated it yet, a fire will start, spreading quickly throughout the entire basement area, and you can hear Carrie Killian laughing. Lore number five is located at this basement window, this open basement window. This is likely how kids snuck in to stay the night for hazing rituals, as they probably knew better than to come through the front or back door. But more importantly, its location overlooking the candle that gives you number one and then starts a fire implies that this is also how whoever the started the fire got in. Finally, this one in the back near the headstones, it mentions the Wendigo's victims that Carrie Killian was blamed for. I believe that this headstone is not a headstone, but a memorial marker for where these kids' bodies were found. So who started the fire, anyway? The bees say it was compounding misunderstandings. She had a ghost guarding her front door, but being thrown back by a spectral force from a bloodstain would not do anything to calm the mob. Someone so thrown back could have dropped their torch, but that wasn't the true cause, was it? No. Someone snuck in through this little cellar door window while the mob was clamoring outside. Perhaps they didn't even mean to do it. They might not have even had a plan for what they would do once they got inside. But what they did was mess with this ritual candle. Or perhaps it was a plant. Perhaps the Illuminati had such malice that an agent slipped in through the open basement window planted this ritual candle that would look like any other piece of debris in her house. Perhaps someone thrown back by the ghost also dropped their torch. It would be a plausible cover for the fire. Either way, I wonder if Carrie Killian could have escaped, or perhaps the stories were true and she was laughing as the house burned. Perhaps seeing this all happen had finally tipped her over into madness. Regardless, I don't think it really matters how exactly the fire started. It was started long ago by rumors, by innuendo, by prejudice. That's why the bees never even mention the actual flames starting, because metaphorically, they've been burning for years. But still, it seems so surreal, doesn't it? How could something like this happen? It was only 30 years ago. Sure, there were moral panics back then, but nothing like this, right? In the 80s, there was something called the Satanic Panic. Lots of people believed that America was under siege from dark Satanic forces, that there was a vast conspiracy to corrupt the nation and especially the children. This is the McMartin Daycare. It was the subject of the longest and most expensive trial in American history up to that point, beginning in 1983 and running until 1990. The owner, Virginia McMartin, and one of the teachers, Ray Bucky, were accused of satanic ritual abuse based on recovered memories from the children. This was despite the children speaking of things that were flat out impossible, like miles and miles of secret tunnels, of people being flushed down toilets whole, or in one case, even fingering Chuck Norris as the one responsible for the abuse. After seven years, Peggy McMartin was cleared of all charges. Ray Bucky had spent five years in jail awaiting trial. He was eventually cleared on all charges. 
after two retrials. This was the cultural climate of the 80s. You can find dozens of cases like this, or vandalism of people being assaulted, all under suspicion of satanic conspiracy. And for every case that made the news, there's probably 20 more that didn't. But that was just the 80s, right? These are the West Memphis Three. In 1994, they were convicted of the rape and murder of three eight-year-old boys. Two of them, Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. and Jason Baldwin, were sentenced to life imprisonment. A third, Damien Eccles, was sentenced to death. Eventually, all three were freed on an Alford plea, which is basically saying, the prosecution could certainly convince a jury of our guilt, but we maintain our innocence. In truth, the prosecution could convince the jury based on the fact that they listened to heavy metal music and played Vampire the Masquerade. Eccles, in particular, was determined by a psychiatrist to be a danger to society because, based on the belief that he could gain superpowers from drinking human blood, which honestly sounds like the psychiatrist misunderstood him describing an RP session. They spent over 18 years in jail. That was over half their life by the time they were released. And were it not for the high profile of the case, the execution of Damien Eccles could easily have gone through. These three kids lost a significant portion of their lives and could have even been executed based solely on the satanic panic. But it's over, right? This is Comet Ping Pong. It's a popular pizza restaurant and concert venue in Washington, D.C. It was also the subject of a conspiracy theory spread over social media by Alex Jones and former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. It alleged, based on extremely flimsy evidence, that the pizza restaurant was actually for a child sex ring engaging in satanic ritual abuse, led by Hillary Clinton. These charges are patently absurd, but a man named Edgar Madison Welch took them seriously enough that on December 4th, 2016, he attacked the restaurant with a rifle to self-investigate the conspiracy. Even he felt a little disillusioned by the lack of evidence he found and he stated to the police that he regretted how he handled the situation. But that's just alone crazy, right? Fueled by fringe YouTube channels. Nothing like how these conspiracy theories were popular daytime television in the 80s. I think you know what this is. Just last year, angry, torch-wielding moms descended on Charlottesville shouting Nazi slogans. This resulted in the death of one counter-protester and the injury of numerous others. I once found it inconceivable that this sort of witch-burning could occur in modern America. Now, I wonder when it will happen for real. Hi, I'm Robin Fishburn, also known as Lucky Stampede. I voice Debbie Fish in I A to B. I also play her in game and on Twitter. I basically do all the production work, writing, scripting, voicing, editing on this show, Questions and Answers, as well as the lore readings. Overall, I do about 90% of the work, so don't tell Sark I said that. I'm sitting in front of you right now because I feel the need to get real. I want you to see the person behind these videos. I'm a trans woman. I'm ethnically Jewish, and I'm a witch. 30 years ago, I would have been inside the house burning with Carrie Killian. And nowadays... I would still be burning. 
because of who I am. In the late 80s and on into the early 90s, not just for being trans, Jewish, or a witch, I could very well have burned for being a gamer. A lot of people like to downplay this, like to say that gamers have never been persecuted when that's simply not the case. 25 years ago, people were convicted of murder because they owned role-playing books. That was like most of the evidence. And we, we shouldn't ignore that that happened. Thing is, times change. Games are mainstream now. Even things like Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering are. <sighs> so I find it very disheartening that so many people who 30 years ago could have been burned because they were gamers would now be standing outside holding torches. Thank you for watching this video. I know it's a departure from my format, but in the future I plan to have questions and answers merge on Tuesday, and on Thursday I'll be doing lore readings. This allows me to focus more attention on episodes like this. Most of them probably won't end up this heavy, but I really felt this needed to be said. This was a big risk, let me tell you. If you enjoyed this, um, I assume you mean the first half, because the latter half is kind of dark. But if you like my stuff in general, then consider hitting like, share, subscribe, notification bell, all that stuff. And if you did not like it, then share it on your right-wing form of choice. I'm pretty sure I'm going to draw some aggro here. Also, special thanks to my patrons, especially Mike's Mind. Our first $3 patron, though I perfectly understand if he doesn't want me to say his name anymore. Yeah.